remember when our children grow up, you know, they didn't even know how to walk, and they'll take one step, and we stood there and clapped, you know, as if, as if we won the Olympics, you know. <laughs> and he did nothing but just take one or two steps, and we're clapping and say, wow, wonderful, you know. Do you think God stands there and feels jealous that you're doing well, you know? Wait till you take a next step, I'll break your head, you know. That's not the way God sees you. God cheers you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow. Here I am to say, you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together world. All together wonderful to me. Oh, here I am. You're all together, love, all together, world, all together, wonderful to me. Here I am, here I am to bow, oh, here I am to bow, here I am to say, you're my God. You're all together, love, you're all together. Natural disasters, calamities that are happening around us. Yes, certainly there are natural calamities and disasters happening. But back then I'll show you that natural calamities happened, but that could not bring the people down to poverty, the people that are blessed by God. In the midst of calamities and disasters, God blessed these people. In the midst of famine, Abraham, Isaac, and so on, became rich. When there was no food in the land, they became rich. No water in their wells, but these people had water in their wells. So God helped them to overcome natural calamities. These days, we have high-tech stuff. People criticize technology. They say technology is bad. Well, I understand there are some uh, advancement in technology that may have something bad in it, but generally technology, I think, is good because technology itself solves a lot of problems. <laughs> Just imagine if we didn't have electricity and uh, this ability to use electricity in this way, I'd have to come at 5 o'clock in the morning, start lighting candles, you know, <laughs> or burning some kerosene lamps or something to... Give us light, you know. What kind of problem we'll have? Just imagine if we didn't have a TA system like we have. These nice speakers. So you can clear, clearly hear what we are speaking. See what technology has done, you know. I remember back in the days when we used to, I used to preach and they used to record it on tapes. Many times the tape would have some problem or the other. It would, it would be just cut and the half an hour sermon is missing, you know. I mean, it'll break my heart, you know. I'm preaching, I'm preaching here. I don't know when I'll preach it next, you know. And they, they simply say, no, no, that got cut, you know, for half an hour we don't have it. <laughs> and then I'll tell them to store it, they'll store it, and uh, then they'll say, well, it's all full of fungus and it cannot be used. It's all gone. The whole entire set is gone. All is gone to waste. Like this, we had to throw away so many things. But now, why? High tech means high tech. <laughs> Did you know we just went on HD a couple of weeks ago? Huh? <laughs> HD a couple of weeks ago. Probably next week we'll go on live on Facebook. <laughs> I mean, 
I feel like technology is exclusively for us only. <laughs> we must use it first. It's good. Everybody says it's bad. It's antichrist. No, I say it's good. It's very good. <laughs> it's very, I'm convinced that it's very good. You know, now they store these things, you know, uh, you can never lose what you're preaching and, and these material and all. It can never be lost for generations to come because you can store it in two, three different places, in hard drives, in cloud. They store it in cloud now, you know. <laughs> you can pull it up from anywhere. Amazing, amazing technology. Thank God for technology. Technology helps us solve our problems. It can help us solve our uh, water problem. It can help solve our... Uh, food production problem. It can help us solve every kind of problem, health problems. Look at all the new uh, advances made in the field of medicine and uh, treatments that are available for people today, you know. Every day it's improving, getting better and better. Thank God for technology. So natural causes, more and more it looks like that cannot pull down anybody from living a successful life, then why are people poor? Even though there is so much technology, technology can be exploited in such a way so that everybody can ev have everything that they wanted in abundance and plenty. There are huge possibilities with technology. Why are then people still poor in a technologically advanced world where we can accomplish anything? Why are people poor? Why can't we get rid of poverty? Why are they poor? What is the reason? Let me cover the first reason. The first reason is man's sin, his sinful nature that is inside of him, that has come into him from Adam's sin on that day it entered into man. It has defiled him completely and made him a different kind of person than what God made him to be. The sinful nature of man produces selfishness so that man lives for himself so that now he has to oppress others in order for him to survive and flourish. He doesn't find anything wrong with it. He can exploit, take advantage and oppress others in order to live well for himself. He lives for his own sake, for, for himself, doesn't care about anything else. Sin, sinfulness, and the, all that it produces, the selfishness, the greed, the grabbing mentality, all of that, is what is making the world poor today and not God. Let me give you some biblical examples. Consider Abraham. Abraham was a very blessed man. The Bible says that he's an aristocrat. You know. He was a huge success. God blessed him in every way, economically. He was very prosperous. But in his house, there was oppression. You know that? Why? You can be so blessed, but still you're a human being, and in human beings, there is this thing called sin that is working. Remember, Sarah suggested that since they don't have child, that he should have a child through Hagar, the slave girl that lived in his house. And he had, with her suggestion, only he had the child. And after she had the child, then some years later, Sarah has the child. So after Sarah has the child, Sarah has a change of mind. The same woman that said, let's have a child through her, now says, throw her out. She shall not be an heir. <laughs> so Abraham comes to Hagar and says, please, here's a bottle of water. Here's some food. Please take your bags and go somewhere. You know, get out of my sight, out of my wife's sight, so we won't have any trouble at home. Please relieve us from this problem. So she gets up and leaves and ends up in a wilderness about to die in the scorching heat without water and without any help, that little boy with her and this woman abandoned by this man who gave her a child. Don't you, don't you call that oppression? <laughs> he should have treated, treated her better. And you know what God does? God is on the side of the oppressed. God comes there. God says to her, don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. And God says, I will bless him and make him a great nation also. Amen. And look how great a nation he has made them. You know. And look how much he has blessed them. God says, I will bless you and make you great also. 
Because I'm a fair, just God. I am against the oppressors. I am for the oppressed. I give a hand to the oppressed. Then God comes and helps that woman there. And the angel of God comes and ministers to her there. So oppression is found everywhere. This is what makes life difficult. You can find a spiritual home. They may be saved going to church shouting hallelujah. But there will be some oppression there. Hello. Husband will be oppressing the wife. Sometimes the wife will be oppressing the husband. Sometimes the children oppressing the parents. Or sometimes one of the family members trying to oppress everybody. Some kind of oppression is working, you see. Because human nature is such. It's become a sinful world. Men have become, men and women have been affected by this thing called sin. So they want to have their own way. They live for themselves. Selfishness, self-interest becomes the primary thing. Therefore, they live for their own sake. They oppress all others and, and everything that is contrary to their wishes. So life becomes very difficult. So some people in the homes feel oppressed. They feel like they don't belong in there. They feel like they are worthless. They are not considered a person at all. They feel like they have no value in the house. That their words are not respected. That they are not needed and they don't matter. Oppression. Modern day oppression is very subtle. Hello. Everybody is very quiet now. I am scared now. <laughs> Modern day oppression I'm talking about is very subtle. It happens in very subtle ways. You can see the manifestation of that evil, sinful nature that came in on that day when Adam sinned. Dominating people. They may be blessed in so many ways. There may be people going to church and so on. Still, these kind of things will be at play in their surroundings. That is what makes happiness sometimes impossible in those situations. People say, why can't God make us happy? Well, God is not against your happiness. God wants you to be happy. But the sinful nature in man, many times we give place to it. Bible says, don't give place to sin. Don't give place to the devil. And we give the place to the devil. And devil through sin begins to dominate and tears our life, our families, and our relationships, and so on, and causes all kinds of problems, you know. So that is how it happens. Take, for example, Isaac, the story of Isaac. There also you find oppression. Remember when famine came? In Isaac's day, there was a famine. Abraham's day, there was a famine. Similarly, in Isaac's day, there was a famine. Everybody is running to Egypt again for grain. And Isaac also decided to run, and God tells him, don't run. I'm going to be with you. I have a covenant with your father. I'm going to bless you. Don't run. I'm going to bless you right where you are. So he was among the Philistines, a foreign country. And he was supposed to live there. And God tells him, you live here, I'll bless you. And sure enough, God blessed him. He reaped a hundredfold, the Bible says. But the ne very next verse, 12th verse in chapter 26 says in Genesis that he became very great. He waxed great and became very great. And then the next verse says, and the people, the Philistines were very jealous about him. Now, let me ask you this. Have you had problems in life? Now, when people have problems, Christians have problems in life, they say immediately, I don't know, brother, why God is taking me through this problem. Well, for your information, God is not taking you through this problem. <laughs> your neighbor is taking you through this problem. Your own brothers and sisters are taking you this problem. Your uncles and aunts are taking you through this. Somebody there out there in the world is taking you Not God is not taking you through this. But God is not interested in giving you problems, my friend. God is interested in leading you out of the problems. Amen. People can be problems. Amen. People can be problems. And mainly, you, you, every, you know, let me preach about myself. It's so safer, you know. <laughs> I've always found it's better to preach about myself. You act like you don't know anything, you know. <laughs> any problem I've ever, ever had, any difficulty I've ever had, had to do with one of the issues was this issue that Isaac faced, jealousy. People don't like you. And you say, why you don't like me? Nothing, there is nothing. 
There's no reason why they shouldn't like you. They just don't like you. The problem with Isaac is this. Every well didn't have water. Wherever he dug a well, there was water. Amen. Everybody is jealous. Why? How come you can have water? We can't have water. Well, he didn't tell God to stop all everybody's water. <laughs> God simply blessed him. God gave him water in his well. So he... He harvested a hundredfold and reaped a hundredfold in the land of famine. Amen. During times of famine, he grew and waxed exceedingly great. God's blessing caused it. And everybody was jealous. And then he will go and dig a well there. They'll chase him out of there. They'll say, it's my father's well. Well, till then, they didn't mind it because there's no water. This guy goes and digs it and there's water, so they chase him. From place to place, they chased him to so many places. Finally, God helped him to settle down in one place. Finally, God saw that these people are so jealous, so he took him to the next level. What is the next level? He made them afraid of him. <laughs> so the king himself came to him and said, look, you're becoming very bitey. The king saw that this guy is more blessed than the king. He's living better off than the king. So the king came to him and said, listen, I don't want any trouble from you. You got too much money. You got too much everything. Tomorrow I don't want you to join my enemies and cause me any trouble. Let's make a covenant so we don't have any problem. You know. Jealousy. You know. Any problem that you ever face, you find God is not causing the problem. God is not jealous of you, my friend. God is happy that you're prosperous. God is happy that you're succeeding. Oh, God is happy that you're taking a step forward. Every step, see, his God is like, you know, you remember when our children grow up, you know, they didn't even know how to walk, and they'll take one step, and we stood there and clapped, you know, as if, as if he won the Olympics, you know. <laughs> and he did nothing but just take one or two steps, and we're clapping and say, wow, wonderful, you know. Do you think God stands there and feels jealous that you're doing well, you know? Wait till you take a next step, I'll break your head, you know. That's not the way God sees you. God cheers you. Amen. God loves it when you progress. God loves it when you walk in his ways and are blessed. God loves it when you, when you, when you are going from success to success. It's God's wish. And I, I believe that God feels sad when you don't succeed and when you're having difficulties. And God is the first one that is there on the scene. So Isaac was oppressed because of jealousy in his life. That's the issue. Jacob, the same thing. After 20 years, Jacob says to his father-in-law, look, look, I mean, for every sheep that was lost, you made me pay. I mean, you read the passage in 31st chapter, it's amazing how you, anyone can have father-in-law like that, you know. <laughs> Check that father-in-law out <laughs> and pray that you never get one like that. <laughs> He says, you, you made me work so hard. For 14 years I worked to marry two of your daughters. He tells it, voices it out. And for 20 years I have worked. And if God was not with me, you would have sent me home empty without one penny after working 20 years. If God was not with me, you would have wiped me out completely and sent me as a poor man. But God was with me, he says. What was the reason for his problems? The reason for problem, our problems was two things. One, Joseph, Jacob himself. He's a cunning, crafty fellow. So he's reaping whatever he sowed. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together. He's working in his life. He gave the bad end of the stick to his brother and now he's getting it back from his uncle. He cheated his brother and took everything that belonged to him. Now he comes to an uncle who's whipping him left and right. You know, 20 years he took work from him. I mean, he did all kinds of injustice. How about seven years he worked to marry that girl and found that it's the wrong girl he gave <laughs> in a dim light wedding. And that's it. I mean, after that, the guy worked seven more years for the girl he wanted. That beats me, you know. <laughs> Any other person would have said, I am resigning, leaving right now today. <laughs> he worked seven more years to marry the second one. And then worked six more years, 20 years later. Still, that man is trying to grab everything that he has and send him away empty. He says, but God was with me. God helped me. 
at one point jacob comes to a conclusion that you cannot live by cunning craftiness blessing is not something that you somehow manage to make yours by cunning craftiness blessing is something that god gives you don't steal it you believe it you possess it you don't steal it it's god's mercy and god's grace so he tells god god if you'll give me food to eat and clothes to wear and take me back to my father's place where i ran away from safe again you will be my god he says he really understood that it's god who makes possible food to eat and clothes to wear he's god who makes possible our protection and our life our survival is god's power that causes all these things to work together he says lord i acknowledge you not my cunning craftiness not my cleverness not my maneuvering and manipulation but your grace and your mercy and your blessing should work in my life he says and then only became a changed man jacob became israel joseph the same way so jacob he was the problem plus his uncle that's a second problem so two problems his own sinful nature his own selfishness his own maneuvering and manipulation and his uncle who can maneuver and manipulate better than him <laughs> so he had double problem <laughs> i'm sure jacob many times said went to god and said god what is this what's happening what are you doing in my life god would have looked at him and said what do you mean i'm not doing <laughs> you are causing all the mess and you're looking at me and asking me what i am doing joseph the same way what wrong did that guy do young guy 16 years old has a dream wonderful dream that even his father and mother brother everybody will come and bow before him one day that god is going to take him to a place and position in life that is so high unbelievable amazing he has a glorious vision and he tells that and everybody is jealous his own brothers were jealous and they immediately wanted to kill him but then they had some mercy sold him and there he encounters a woman you know and some problem with her she wants to tempt him and entice him into a relationship and then he escapes from there and runs and but then finally blamed for misdeed there wrongly amazing how a young boy young man is able to resist the temptation you know how could he resist the temptation now when we, i remember when we were young they saw they, we went to church sunday and they said be holy next week we went and said be holy i said yeah we heard it already you know we're trying brother you know it's not working and next sunday we said be holy otherwise you will go to hell i said wow my you know let's try it again very hard that's what is not working and next sunday we went they said be holy but finally then i found out how holiness works they thought holiness comes when you make a man poor don't give him any money don't give him any comfort you make him sleep in a straw mat and walk all the way to school and everything then he'll be holy we believe in the virtue of poverty to make a man holy but we found it was not working how does a man become holy god knows how to make a man holy he takes a young boy at a very young age and gives him a lofty vision for life he tells him you're going to be a great person i've got a place and position for you you're going to go sky high my friend i'm going to take you right to the very top get ready for that your place is up there on the top you're going to become a great person one day and joseph is filled with that vision that god has for him therefore all this temptation these things look silly to him he doesn't want to meddle with this because his place is on the top he doesn't want to go with the silly stuff like this that's how you make a person holy you give him a big vision see the problem with, the, with preaching today christian preaching is we never give a big vision to people we never lift their sights high we never make them lift up their high eyes like god told abraham lift up your eyes and see as far as your eyes can see i will give to you god said we never let people lift up their eyes and look at what god has for them found a friend oh such a friend that he made my heart so god himself is with me and 
And I know I'm never alone Know all my tomorrows will be better than all my hopes We've got love, grace, peace and power and joy in the Holy Ghost We've got love my God is never wrong and He makes stand for me We got grace, it blew apart my chains and set the sinner free It's like a river and you'll never run it dry We got power over fear and death The past filled up with joy The Holy Spirit fills me up And I need Him every day Fire, faith, and confidence And knowing what to say I gave my heart and all I am To the one who loves me most We got love Grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got love, my God is never wrong, and He may stand for me. We got good, it blew up on my chains and set the sinner free. It's like a river, and you'll never run it dry. We got power over fear and death, and minds filled up with joy. Spirit fills me up and I need him every day. Fire, faith, and confidence and knowing what to say. I gave my heart and all I am to the one who loves me most. We got love, grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got love, my God is never wrong. He may stand for me. We got love, it blew apart my chains and set the sinner free. It's like a river and you never run it dry. You got power over fear and death and hearts filled up with joy. Oh, we got love, my God is never wrong. He makes stuff for me. We got great. It blew up on my chains and set the sin of free. We got great. It's like a river and you never run it dry. We got power over fear and death and hearts filled up with joy. Friend, oh, such a friend that he made my heart his so own. God himself is with me, and I know I'm never alone. I know all my tomorrows will be better than all my hopes. We got love, grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got love, grace, peace, and power, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got love, grace, peace, and power, and joy. 